Greetings, comrades, and welcome back to another episode of the Comrade Cast. And today I am late because I just have had an exhausting week. It's been an exhausting week down at the old Smile Factory. What I wanted to do was actually have the episode of the Comrade Cast be a live episode this week and kind of do a live covering of the debate, the Republican debate on Fox. Unfortunately, I just did not have the gas in the tank for that. But today, what I'm going to bring you is, in my opinion, something even greater. I watched that whole ridiculous debate, and I took the time to rank our competitors from worst to best. So we are going to go through a ranking of who did the worst and who did the best in this, uh, in what is, as of recording, last night's debate. So again, going to be a pretty chill pretty laid back episode and then we're going to end off talking a little bit about the Purgosian explosion first we had his whole coup implosion and then his whole aeroplane explosion so we're going to talk so we're going to be talking a little bit about that at the end of the episode maybe I'll be able to finagle it as our feel good story although I don't necessarily feel that good about it but I kind of like the dark humor aspect of that Without further ado, I do want to jump right into it, and we will get into the infallible tier maker. Although, as you can see, I have named these tiers myself, and as mentioned, we will be going from worst to best. So this will be in a ranked order. One of, again, one of the big things I always dislike about tier lists is when people will just put in whatever willy-nilly order that they want. It's got to be in a specific order. Please put it in a specific order. For the love of Christ, when you're making your tier list, just put it from worst to best. That's all you got to do. So that is what we will do. Um, and it doesn't have Donald Trump here. And I wish I could add more icons. And I really do like these kind of like stylized icons they have for every one of the candidates. However, we will still be rating Donald Trump. I will throw him on there. I have a little picture I'm going to post or whatever. So yeah, he'll get on there. Don't worry. We will actually rank him, even though he wasn't at the debate. And when we do rank him, we will discuss the political implications of him not being at the debate. There we go. Zoom in a little bit more, make it myself look a little bit less disembodied. But yes, we will be talking about his political calculations to skip this debate when we actually rate him. And we're also going to be doing a tiny brief introduction on some of these candidates when we rate them because not all of them are that well known but for the ones who are much more widely known i'm probably not going to do much to introduce them so without further ado our tiers are our lowest tier is not even a human being second tier is junker than junk middle tier is holding it together second to top tier is making an impact and then the final tier is the champ's circle. All right, so let's start off with the worst of the worst. And this may come as somewhat of a surprise to you. Well, actually, probably not a huge surprise. But in the bottom, not even a human being category is going to go. I believe he's Arkansas governor, our former Arkansas governor. Oh, fuck, man. What the hell is this guy's name? Asa Hutchinson is this guy's name. So, again, I have no idea why this guy is running. This is really the first time that I had any kind of interaction with him, was watching them, watching him during this debate. He barely made any impact. It looked like he had some, some looked like there was wrong with his eye. It looked like he had a pink eye infection or something like that when he was talking. The most notable thing I remember about him is when they were talking about Donald Trump in the debate and... They asked them to like raise their hand of like, if Donald Trump was convicted of a felony, would you still support him as your party's nominee? And he was one of the people that didn't raise his hand. And then they asked him, why, why didn't you raise your hand? And he's like, no, sorry, I'm not going to try and do a Southern accent. And he's like, basically, I believe that he has disqualified himself because of his actions on January 6th and everybody booed him. And that was the most notable interaction he had during the entire debate. I would be shocked if he makes it to the next debate. He will gain no traction and will be eliminated shortly. After him, the next worst candidate may surprise you, starting in the junker than junk tier, is going to be 
South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. Tim Scott, I actually had high-ish hopes for going into this debate. Tim Scott being one of the few Republicans on the stage that I think could actually have any kind of chance in a general election. Although after seeing him on this debate stage, not so much. He was just very lackluster. I don't really recall him making any kind of points that really stood out whatsoever. He's really trying to toe the line and draw that contrast of like, I'm the moderate, sensible Republican. I still like Republican things, but I'm not crazy type of deal. And while he did that fine enough, he managed to avoid saying anything ridiculously outlandish or crazy. He did, however, fail to make any sort of impact, and I would be surprised to see him at the next debate. Which is a shame for him and the Republican Party, by, by and large, because he probably would be one of the more electable candidates in an actual general election scenario. And now, finishing up the junker than junk tier, in third worst, we have Doug Burgum. I'm not even sure what this guy's political position is. Again, this was the first interaction I had with him, or this is the first time I'd ever really seen him in any kind of context. Doug Burgum is, I think, from North Dakota. In his opening line, he talked about how he's from this town of like 100 people and how they're all wishing him and all this crap. But to be honest, of all the barely known candidates in this field, I think he did the best. I don't know why he made an impression on me as this kind of like gummy, fleshy human that had vaguely likable characteristics. He had a somewhat of an endearing quality, just kind of like that weird, waxy politician that is saying the things that he that are, are right and, and a little bit reasonable, but he is saying them in a way that he thinks it's like the most revolutionary thing in the world, but everybody's already 15 steps in front of him. It's like, it's like your grandparents trying to explain to you how to use a smartphone and they're actually doing it well. Like they're explaining how to use the smartphone well, but they think that they're total geniuses for doing this. And you're like, yeah, grandma, this is something I've known for a decade now. Thank you for filling me in type of thing. But good for you, grandma, knowing how to operate a smartphone. So just so you guys understand, one of the ways that I'm framing this is that Every candidate essentially has different goals and where they are appearing on this tier list is how much they accomplish those goals. What I'm saying is that some candidates can appear higher even though they may not have won the debate, but because they accomplish those goals. And I think we can say with our bottom tier here, absolutely none of the people involved came anywhere near accomplishing those goals. So now we're talking about people who basically just held the line right now that they maintain their position, even if that's a low position. And that is pretty much losing for a lot of these people in the grand scheme of things, but they didn't diminish their current standing is what I'm saying. And one of those people, in my opinion, is former Vice President Mike Pence being the first holding it together. And just to remind you guys, the closer to the left, which is my right, but on the screen it will be your guys' left, the uh, closer you are, the higher up on the tier list you are. One of the things that I did differently this time when it comes to watching these type of, de type of debates is that usually I will watch them and then I will go and see what people are saying and then watch some after, after debate commentary and some clips and that sort of thing. And then I'll start to reflect on my own feelings and opinions on the debate. This time I've did, done it differently. I saw everybody else's commentary and then watched the debate myself. And then just after watching the debate, I'm filming this episode for you guys. And one of the things I saw in a lot of the commentary after this debate was that Mike Pence was one of the big losers. I don't think that he was a big loser And this. And I saw a lot of this coming out specifically from like left-wing people and left-wing commentary. And that's another thing I want to try and be clear is that I'm trying to think more um, about this debate from a right-wing and Republican perspective rather than looking at it from a left-wing perspective, looking at it from my own perspective and seeing who won from my own perspective. 
I'm trying to think of it more, at least how the base would respond to them and how the base would respond to this debate and how they performed in it. So I think if you analyze this from a left-wing perspective, yeah, he lost the debate. But in terms of the base perspective, I think he held it together. Unfortunately, he didn't accomplish what he really needed to accomplish was, which is there are a variety of candidates here that are all really running for the anti-Trump mantle in a similar fashion to in 2016. And Pence is one of the people who is trying to absorb and hold on to that anti-Trump mantle. And in that sense, he held his own, but he didn't gain any ground. So he held his own really by defending his decision not to overturn the 2020 election. And they had another one of those moments where they just like, yeah, raise your hand if you think Mike Pence did the right thing type of thing. Or that, sorry, they asked every candidate if Mike Pence did the right thing on January 6th by refusing to overturn the election. And in that sense, I think Pence really held his own. He's not going to lose any ground. But the thing is here, he didn't switch anybody's side. He got lots of boos. He got lots of jeers from the crowd. But for those who are with him and those who support him, they're not going anywhere yet. But again, he's not going to gain any new supporters because of his performance, which is why he is at the bottom of the holding it together tier. So next up in the holding it together tier, we have former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. And I'll say, guys, going into the debate, Chris Christie was a guy I had a, a lot of hope for. I really hoped that he could be the anti-Trump uh, mantle, that he could take that anti-Trump mantle and be the one to really go against the Trump movement within the Republican Party. Not only because I do think that he is probably best suited for it, but just from the entertainment factor Chris Christie is at the point where he doesn't give a shit anymore. He is just doing whatever he wants, saying whatever he wants. And that is wildly entertaining. And unfortunately, I feel like he didn't really bring that side of himself to this debate. He did have a few really good one-liners. He took on Vivek Ramaswamy, who we will get to, one of the candidates, the perceived front runner outside of Donald Trump's specter. He had some really great lines against him where he basically accused him of sounding like a chat GBT AI. So I do think I had higher hopes for Chris Christie than maybe I should have, and that might be one of the reasons why I'm rating him towards the middle of the pack. I do think that he did definitely deliver his solid one-liners, but he didn't do enough, and he didn't explode enough to really, to really make the impact make that breakout that he needed to with the anti-Trump segment of the Republican Party to begin to coalesce that support behind him. And with that, that will bring us to the last member of our holding it together tier, and that is going to be Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Oops. There we go. So yes, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis rounds out the holding it together tier and the reason I think Ron DeSantis, he did hold it together in the sense I don't think he's going to go further down after this debate. I think he may have finally found his floor. But I don't think he made enough of an impact to actually break through again and start coalescing that anti-Trump support behind him. Because despite the fact that he wants to seem like he is a pro-Trump Republican, he is an anti-Trump Republican trying to masquerade as a pro-Trump Republican with a lot of these kind of pro-Trump talking points. So his political goal still remains to try and coalesce as much of the anti-Trump Republican support behind him while doing as little to piss off the pro-Trump Republican support. That remains his political goal. And honestly, I do think he tread that line or he trod that line very well in this debate, but it wasn't enough to really get him to where he needs to be, which is a turnaround on his sputtering campaign. So that's why I can't say that he made an impact because I don't think he made that turnaround. But a couple of key points for uh, Ron DeSantis's debate. One of the things I read coming out before this debate is that Ron DeSantis had hired a very skilled kind of 
debate prepper and debate coordinator for this debate going up to um, what we just saw in Milwaukee. And it seems like that debate prep actually paid off because he had some pretty good moments and some really good one-liners and was ultimately a real master of deflection. Like he was deflecting all these important questions coming at him like there was no tomorrow. One of the things, actually, you know what? Let me, let me show you guys something real quick here. Just bear with me a second. I promise I'm going somewhere. As a lot of you guys know, I love to cook. Cooking is one of my favorite hobbies. And I also love to consume a lot of cooking YouTube content. And one of my favorite series is on uh, Epicurus here. And they have this series where they have a chef who is a professional chef, cooked all their life, take a home chef's ingredients and cook something, they cook a basic meal with that. In this case, it's uh, pasta carbonara. And then they have a home chef take the professional chef's ingredients and try and replicate that professional recipe. It's pretty interesting, a little uh, series and experiment. So this is the professional chef's recipe book for his carbonara. And of course, the, the home chef is trying to figure it out. He's looking over the recipe book, which is just the ingredients essentially listed out. It's the headline is what you're making. And then below is the ingredients and then another headline of what you're making and the ingredients involved in that. And this is how I basically, this is, this is my notes for the show. This is how I set up my notes for the show. I have the show title and I have basically bullet points of what I want to talk about. And then in some cases I'll have a little more detail about points that I want to bring up. So it's slightly more detailed than this. So basically I have, uh, you know, we're going to talk about Republican debate. I have my title. I have my ratings and then I have small bullet points between every single one of these individuals. So if you're wondering how I organize the show, it's basically like this. It's bullet points for what I want to talk about, but in terms of the actual substance and how much I'm going to put in it and the amount I'm going to speak about it, all of that is really left up to my interpretation as the show continues. Anyway, I bring this up because for my notes for Ron DeSantis, I put that debate prep paid off, uh, great deflection, bad for America. He especially had a great line at the beginning of the debate where they were talking about climate change and the moderators asked everybody to raise their hand if they believed in the role of anthropomorphic climate change or man-made climate change. I can't remember what the hell they called it. Either way. So Ron DeSantis jumps in there immediately and he's like, listen, we're not school children. Let's actually have the debate. Let's actually talk about this. And then he proceeds to say absolutely nothing. And I was like, fuck, man, that's a really good line, really good way to cut through that kind of bullshit. And then, of course, like I said, he goes and proceeds to, act, to articulate absolutely nothing of substance because he didn't actually state what he believed in regards to climate change. He didn't actually state whether or not he believed climate change was uh, caused by man or not. And he did the exact same thing when asked about uh, Mike Pence and whether or not Mike Pence did the right thing. And he, he, and he uh, deflected immediately and he's like, you know what? <laughs> Sorry, I, I can't. I can't. I, I shouldn't do voices. But he has a really nasally and irritating voice, Ron DeSantis. In any case, he basically deflects and he says, you know what, the real thing we got to stop is the weaponization of the DOJ by our political enemies. And of course, this gets massive applause from the crowd. And of course, he doesn't go on to explain whether or not he actually thought that old Mike Pence did the right thing. So again, I was thinking, man, master deflection he did it a couple of times really well throughout the night. And unfortunately, now we don't know his actual stance on climate change or if he thinks that Mike Pence did the right thing. We don't know those things, but he deflected from them expertly. But his issue was he didn't really land that killer blow again that he needed to um, coalesce that anti-Trump support. And that was the big thing from this debate. Con considering that Trump isn't in the actual debate, considering that Trump isn't in the actual debate, the majority of these people are vying for that anti-Trump mantle. And I don't think any of them were able to really strike that killer blow and become that anti-Trump avatar. In fact, I think that the waters are actually murkier than they were before. And we'll get into that. But speaking of Trump, I am going to have him open up the next tier here in our making an impact tier. 
So you might be wondering what I'm going to do, given the fact that there's no picture of Donald Trump here. What am I going to do to represent him? I will show you exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw him in. <laughs> All right, there he is. <laughs> there's Donald Trump. You can see the monstrosity that I've birthed, that I've birthed forth into the world. So here we have Donald Trump making an impact, able to make an impact without even appearing at the debate and to talk about why I think it's obviously the politically smart thing to do not to appear at this debate. There's no question. It's a bitch move. You should go to all the debates. You should debate your actual ideas in a public forum in front of everybody. This is obviously something you should do if you actually believe what you believe. And if you are as confident in your ideas and yourself as you say you are. And of course, he relentlessly hammered Biden for not having the full suite of debates. And of course, this is something I agreed with at the time. You should have always more debates. More debates is always better, regardless if it's a primary, a general, whenever, in my opinion. The more debates, the better. There should probably be... Anyway, just, just a rule of thumb. Generally speaking, more debates is definitely the better way to go. That being said, though, the thing is here is that there's zero reason for Trump to go the, to this debate because he stands to gain absolutely nothing. He is already leading in the polls by ridiculous proportions. Virtually every poll has him well over that 50% threshold, which basically means that even if anti-Trump support were able to coalesce behind one candidate, it's very unlikely that that candidate would actually be able to defeat Donald Trump in the end because he still maintains majority support from the party. And if he goes on to that debate stage, there is no question he's going to be asked about his legal troubles. He is going to be the target of every single attack. And knowing him, he could easily say something that probably, there's probably nothing he could say in that debate that would hurt him in the Republican primary. Absolutely nothing. Though there is plenty he could say in that debate which would hurt him in the general election. So from his perspective, obviously it's more prudent to keep your mouth shut during a primary because from where he's sitting, he effectively has this thing locked up anyway. So he may as well just say nothing and not risk the chance of saying something that would hurt him in the general election. But the reason I put him under making an impact is because the guy is such a specter, he's such a beast, particularly within the Republican Party, that he makes an impact by not being there. Even by not being there, his presence is known, his impact is felt, because he has, again, such sway that whatever he does is going to, it's going to change the face of the party. It's going to change the face of the party, whether he decides to show up or whether he doesn't decide to show up. And in this case, he ended up looking, I think, pretty well. He makes impact by not showing up. He still shows that he has power and clout within the party, and he doesn't hurt himself any more in the general election than all of his legal troubles are probably hurting him already. So overall, I think that Donald Trump shouldn't be too worried after this debate that someone is going to come and take his mantle from him. All right, so we're down to our final two and only one can be in the champion circle. So obviously, once we decide who is who, it's going to make the other one obvious. So we're down to Vic Ramaswamy and Nikki Haley. So who was the big winner and who was the second big winner? Still a big winner, but not as much. I guess you could call them the, the penultimate winner. All right, I won't keep you guys waiting too much longer. Obviously, both these candidates did well, considering everything. Though, ultimately, there can only be one winner in a ranked worst-to-best video. And that winner is not Nikki Haley. She is the second-place candidate in my estimation. Oh, crap. Damn. Unfortunately, Donald Trump's monstrosity can only grace us for a little bit, but you guys know where he was, and I'll, I'll redraw it, and we'll have a, a, a final tier list with him back in at the end. Either case, you guys know where he was, and then after him, 
is going to be South Carolina governor and former UN ambassador Nikki Haley, who, again, this is coming from a lot of left-wing commentary. I see in a lot of left-wing commentary nail her as the winner of this debate. From like a left-wing perspective, she is the winner of the debate because I think she came off in terms of wanting to inherit that anti-Trump mantle, not the winner and not the front runner, but a very, very strong contender for this anti-Trump mantle. I think she came on and she articulated herself very well. It's clear that this is not her first rodeo. She's been in several debates at several points in her life. She knows what she's doing. She knows how to get her point across and she knows how to sound good while she's doing it. She's very good at walking that fine line of still being inviting and articulate in her speech while also being an authoritative source and coming off as a person of import and that's someone you should take seriously. And she did it very well last night. I think she should be very happy with her performance. The only thing she didn't really do, again, is strike those killing blows. Again, she came out and she articulated herself very well on a variety of issues from uh, abortion to war in Ukraine to how to handle events on January 6th. She, I think, again, articulated herself well on all those points. The only thing is, and the reason I can't give her that winner spot is because I don't think she ultimately accomplished what she needed to do. What she did definitely do was make an impact and save herself off from elimination. I think she's going to see um, a bump from this debate. I think people are going to give her a second look. Ultimately, though, I don't think she is going to be the nominee. I think if she were the nominee, she could give Joe Biden a definite run for his money. But that being said, I, I don't think she'll get past the primary. And unfortunately, she didn't perform well enough to become that anti-Trump mantle. All that she did was perform well enough to put herself again in that pack. So, of course, that leaves the winner of the debate and the best performer in the debate, in my opinion, none other than entrepreneur, businessman, not a political figure before, our boy, Vivek Ramaswamy. Sorry, I, I just had to do that. His name is so unbelievably fun to say. So, my boy, Vivek wins the debate, Vivek, the swam dog, as I call him, and his friends call him, or even in this case, he's the swam dog millionaire. Me and the swam dog go way, way back. Years, years back. Just so you know, I've, I've never interacted with Vivek Ramaswamy in my life. Just, I want to make it clear, definitely don't agree with his policies, don't agree with his politics. But when it came to this debate, he did exactly what he needed to do and accomplished his goals. So for the Swam Dog, his big goal here is basically to, one, make as big an impact as he can. And I think he definitely did that. And two, and this is definitely more speculation, but I, I think it's probably true, which is to addition as Donald Trump's vice president. I don't think he's in it to win it. I think he's in it to make a splash, and hopefully that splash is going to be big enough that old Daddy Trump looks his way. And on those grounds, yes, I think he absolutely succeeded in those goals. So he basically set himself up during this debate as the contrast to all the other classic politicians in a very similar way to what Donald Trump did in 2016. He's trying to set himself up as like the next Donald Trump without all the kind of baggage, right? He has this, so he claims this kind of like rags to riches story where he experienced the American dream and started a whole bunch of businesses and got really wealthy. So he's trying to say, I'm the new flavor of Trump. I'm the next flavor. Once you guys are done with this guy, you guys can come and get a taste of me and oh boy, you're going to like it. And in that sense, I definitely think he set himself up well. He also set himself up well to be liked within the Republican base, but not so much in the general election base. And this is part of the reason why I think he won the debate. And I'm looking at this from the 
perspective of a Republican base voter or someone in the Republican ba base and not Nikki Haley, I think he won because he accomplished making this impact with the right wing base. And while I do think Nikki Haley had a better technical debate performance, it's not necessarily what these debates are about anymore. Everyone's trying to accomplish their own goals and some of them have higher bars to achieve than others. Anyway, sorry, I got derailed there. As I was saying, he really stood out probably amongst the Republican base by A, framing himself as that I'm not a super PAC puppet. I'm my own man. I can say what I want. B, by coming out and saying that he thinks that climate change is a hoax. This is why he was the only one who came out and actually said that straight up on the stage. So obviously drawing himself contrast there. And then, of course, C, refusing to attack Donald Trump and propping him up at any point that he could. And I almost forgot D, he was the only one out there that said he wasn't going to increase funding for Ukraine. And that is going to draw him a lot of support with a very uh, specific sub base and subset of the Republican Party. There is a pretty large base within the kind of Republican movement that believes that we should cease funding to Ukraine because Rush is really the good guy, <laughs> not President Zelensky. President Zelensky is the bad guy. We're supporting the wrong side in this war because Russia is the real defender of Western civilization and, and, and so on and so forth. I don't want to get into the whole debate that, that and the whole train of logic that they have. And this is a feeling mostly, I would say, on, on the fringe of the right wing. And it's true, there is definitely a tanky fringe on the left that is still to this day supportive of Russia for some unknown reason, despite the fact that Russia is pretty much a fascist dictatorship at this point. But those people do definitely exist on the left. However, I would say that they don't nearly have the amount of political sway in the discourse that the pro-Russian camp does within right-wing discourse. So anyway, that also endeared him, I think, to a very, a very vocal subset of the Republican base. And all of those together, he definitely came out and he drew the contrast that I think he was intending to and wanted to. And I definitely think he's going to shoot up in the polls. In fact, he might even overtake Ron DeSantis. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not willing to make that bold of an assumption yet, but he, I think, definitely solidified himself as the third place choice in this race and maybe even the second place choice. All right, so there you have it, our final tier list for the first Republican debate. <laughs> a new Donald Trump uh, drawn back in there. <laughs> Get a more accurate, accurate reflection of where everybody is. Overall, though, my thoughts coming out of this debate was it really revealed a very fundamentally divided party. You could see that there were a lot of issues that were brought up that had, that had irreconcilable answers, I guess you can say. And there were people booing and cheering for some of these, some of these answers, right? You could hear people booing and cheering at the same time during a lot of this debate. It, you could hear Chris Christie got booed the shit out of, they almost booed him so hard <laughs> that he couldn't talk. And at some point, old Brett Bear had to come in and tell the audience to cram it. Basically, we're trying to have a debate here. And... Overall, I just got the feeling that there are some serious fault lines in this party and that right now no one can stitch them together. Um, someone like Donald Trump can kind of paper over it for the short term, but as things progress, it's it becoming pretty clear that these differences are very large and I don't know how they're going to reconcile them. One of the things that's actually going to make a whole episode about this and i might still do that at some point which is how republicans are turning on jesus <laughs> like turning on the principles of christianity because they see them as like too woke and too liberal and uh, at that point you know that things have got seriously wrong in the republican party when the, Re the party of jesus christ is re is rejecting the literal words of jesus Though in the realm of debates, in the grand scheme of things, 
to me, this one was a pretty mid-tier one. I don't think it's going to change the board hugely, but definitely enough for some people to probably rise and uh, fall in response. So now moving on to the end of the segment. I'm not going to call this our feel-good story as quality dark humor as that might be. We have the Progosian Explosion. Of course, we had his, his coup, which I called at the time the Progosian Implosion. I'm so happy. <laughs> now I can square the circle with the Progosian Explosion. And in case you don't know, Yevgeny Progosian, leader of the Russian military group, the Wagner group, uh, was, on, was on a plane traveling over Russia, which mysteriously crashed under unknown circumstances. Right now, the official story is that it was some sort of mechanical failure. The unofficial story is that the plane was probably shot down. That meme was from uh, Factus, by the way, so shout out to him. This is another meme from Dragon, where I don't want to explain this to you guys. You can just look at it and see. I guess I, there are people who are listening. Basically, it's the Wikipedia article where <laughs> it says Yevgeny Prigozhin is a Russian oligarch, a military leader, and then is, is highlighted. And then there's a picture of some hands on a keyboard ready to type. Yes, this was confirmed that this plane crashed. He was one of the passengers on this plane. Everyone is presumed dead. How it crashed again, big mystery. Like the internet consensus is it was probably shot down. But that ends the tale of Yevgeny Prigozhin. I am sure if you recall just three months ago when we had his little coup attempt there, we were all talking about how Yevgeny Prigozhin is not long for this world. He is a dead man walking, and that effectively seems to have been the case. There was absolutely no way that Putin could let a man who challenged his authority so blatantly and so obviously, not just in front of Russia, but in front of the entire world, there's no way that he could let that stand. So I think we all knew that this was coming. It was just a matter of how, not when, and now we have our answer. So there's still a lot of big questions coming out of this whole incident. <laughs> what is Putin going to do now with the whole Wagner group? Right now, apparently they're being led by like a council of commanders, though I can't imagine that many of those commanders will still be alive for much longer either. So we have this tweet here. Apparently an evacuation of Russian PMC fighters has begun from Belarus to Russia. An, uh, an IL-76 aircraft landed in Belarus and apparently evacuated them to Russia. I think we all know what this means. They were summarily evacuated to a gulag where they will remain there for the rest of their lives. Then moving forward, and this is actually from an Australian, this is from ABC News, Australian Broadcasting Corporation. It's because I took this from shout out to Rotar, one of our Australian members. I just took this article from one of the articles he posted on our Discord, which is that Russia removes as Air Force Chief Sergei Sorovkin after mutiny-related disappearance. So say reports. So effectively, this guy here, Sorovkin, if you guys don't know, he was also the chief commander of the Russian forces in Ukraine for a brief moment back towards the end of 2022. He was the commander when the Russians retreated from Kyrgyzstan. He was the one who ordered that retreat. But more importantly, he is the mastermind behind the defenses, which are right now proving to be um, one of Russia's few bright spots in this war and have been able to pretty much stall the Ukrainian counter advances in their tracks. Of course, this is not the end of the counter offensive in Ukraine. As we've talked about, they have begun to switch to different tactics, most of which involve counter artillery fire and then trying to bring together enough firepower to advance from there. There is no question that these defenses have proved to be highly effective and very, very diff and a very difficult obstacle for the Ukrainian armed forces to overcome. What Putin has decided to do was to take one of the few effective members of his general staff and say, eh, purged you, you're purged, you're relieved of all duties. And of course, I would not be surprised if this guy again 
finds himself in a car explosion or plane explosion or train <laughs> explosion or eats a bad piece of meat or slips on a tile and cracks his head, I think this is the likely future for the general. And this bodes poorly for Russia because Russia doesn't exactly have a deep bench of military minds they can draw on. If they are lucky enough to have anybody who is remotely competent in one of their positions of power, they should hold on to that for dear life. So it seems pretty clear that the axe is falling on a lot of these people and Putin is moving to try and secure his, try and secure his flank from some of these people who are threatening it. But the thing here is, is that Wagner was becoming the primary outlet for support among a lot of these sort of Russian ultra-nationalist elements. And now with them gone, the thing is that support doesn't go away. And the fact of the matter is, I think that those people are going to blame Putin for eliminating their hero, quote unquote, their Wagner boss that was finally getting results against Ukraine. They're going to aim that anger at Putin. And as a result, they're going to become less of his support base and less of his allies. And like we talked about in Russian politics, there's that 50% of the half of the population is apolitical. And then there's 25% which are very against the war. And then there's the 25% which are very pro the war. And effectively, Putin needs to maintain the support of one of those groups in order to maintain political power. He's obviously not going to get the support of the anti-war Russians. They are, these are the people who have never supported Putin from the very beginning. They're not going to start supporting him now. But with this kind of pro-war ultra-nationalist core turning against him, that bodes some serious issues for Vladimir Putin's future. And I don't know what those people are going to do. I think that what is most likely is that they are going to look for a new avatar to put their support into. And I think that they are no longer going to be looking to the war in Ukraine. Instead, they are going to be looking to how can we overthrow Putin so we can get one of our guys in there who will actually do what needs to be done in Ukraine. So the hammer is falling on a lot of these people involved with the coup back in June. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be enough to stem the damage that Putin has suffered to a lot of his core support. And uh, yeah, there's still going to be a lot of long-term implications to this. And with that, I am going to have to end this for now. I want to thank you guys for watching. The reason I had this background this whole time was because I have my black shirt on today. And I didn't want to go upstairs and change it. <laughs> I just put background there. Anyway, with that, I want to thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Comrade Cast. And until next time, you guys take care.